They were not bound by time. They were not bound by time. So although uh, we only have an hour or about an hour, I'm, I'm willing to hang out a little bit after the hour. Um, oh my ear, okay. Can everybody hear me okay? Okay, okay. Um, so I'm willing to hang out a little bit after the hour, but we are bound by this hour, but that doesn't mean that the teaching, the education, the growth, the transformation doesn't continue um, outside of this space. So with a teaching, they are meant to be participatory. So I ask that you all not be shy, use the chat. I'll be asking a lot of questions. Um, I'll be asking you to reflect on things. And I wanna hear what you have to say. And I might even call on some folks to help me read some quotes throughout the presentation. Uh, another thing like why I wanted to call it a teaching, a teaching and not a, a, like a, a webinar or a, like, I'm not, I'm not an expert lecturing to you or lecturing at you. Like we are here together co-creating this experience, co-creating this space. We all have our own, you know, expertise, our lived experience. Um, I may not have all the answers. Um, I might flub some things and that's okay. Um, so yeah, oh, and, and lastly, this, this is being recorded so you don't have to worry about um, taking a whole bunch of notes um, or if you miss anything, you are able. You will be able to go back and re uh, watch the recording, and there will be an email sometime soon after the presentation where you'll get all of the resources that I mentioned here. So don't worry about um, missing out on any of that stuff. So with that said, okay. So I want you all to introduce in the chat. Let's get started in the chat. Introduce yourself. If you can say. Well, we see your name, but you say your name, your pronouns, where you're coming from, and one thing, just let us know one you know, special thing about who you are. Not what you do, but who are you? That's what I wanna hear. Uh, so I'll introduce myself briefly. I'm Veronica, pronouns she, her. I am the vision and strategy leader. Well, that's what I do. I'm the vision and strategy leader <laughs> for ASDA. Um, but one thing about who I am is I'm a, as you can see back here, I'm a plant mama, uh, a new plant mama, and I'm so excited. Uh, and I am coming to you from Kigali, Rwanda today. And one, I guess one fun fact is I, as of today, I've been in Rwanda seven months, which is exciting to me. Okay, so don't be shy, use the chat, and I'm going to share my slides. So we got Pittsburgh and North Carolina. Awesome. Okay. To present. Okay. Okay. All right. So today. Our teaching, well, you all know, is about intersectional liberation and hate. Oops. Okay. <clears throat> so the first thing, like, if you ever seen me speak before, I always like to um, make sure everyone in the room that we're operating from the same assumptions, or we at least come to some kind of consensus or an understanding about some of the language and terminology that we'll be using. So the first um, experiential activity that we are going to get into is are we operating from the same assumptions? So I wanna hear from you in the chat, like what is your definition or your understanding of intersectionality, of liberation and haze? You can do one, you can do all, um, it doesn't have to be perfect. Um, yeah, let's just get the conversation going. Oops, sorry. How do I backtrack? Sorry. Let me move this. Okay. 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 Do we have any answers in here for what is intersectionality? What is your understanding of it, your definition? So Adele, I hope I'm saying your name correctly. Adele saying intersectionality is the matrix of identities 
positionalities that each person inhabits that is made of both privilege and oppression. Okay. Yes, Kimberly Crenshaw coined the term. So providing dignity to all bodies in the joint effort in liberation from the harmful effects of white supremacy. So Jackie, is this your definition of liberation? It's sort of a all encompassing kind of thing, but certainly more along the lines of Hayes. Um, Thank you, thank you. So while you all are contemplating thinking about it, <clears throat> I'm gonna go ahead and share. I actually have a clip. Let me go to present. Hope you always can see this well. Okay, so we actually have a clip by Kimberly, Kimberly Crenshaw on what is intersectionality. And before I get into it, can you all let me know if you can hear? Veronica. Oh, no. You'll have to exit out and then share with sound. There's like a little option at the very bottom of the share option. Okay. Let me do that. Okay. Let me stop. Okay. Do new share. And share sound. Got it. Intersectionality is just a metaphor for understanding the ways that multiple forms of inequality or disadvantage sometimes compound themselves and they create obstacles that often are not understood within conventional ways of thinking about anti-racism or feminism or whatever social justice advocacy structures we have. Intersectionality isn't so much a grand theory, it's a prism for understanding certain kinds of problems. African-American girls are six times more likely to be suspended than white girls. That's probably a race and a gender problem. It's not just a race problem, it's not just a gender problem. So I encourage people to think about how the convergence of race stereotypes or gender stereotypes might actually play out in the classroom, between teachers and students, between students and other students between students and administrators and commit themselves to understanding that as a way of intervening and providing equal educational opportunity for all students, regardless of their identities. Identity isn't simply a self-contained unit. It is a relationship between people in history, people in communities, people in institutions. So schools do a good job when they understand that and when they commit themselves to curricular development to opportunities in the school for all students to understand the histories that have brought us to this particular moment. You can't change outcomes without understanding how they've come about. So independent schools can take the lead on that to be responsive to their student populations and to the communities out of which the students come. So any any thoughts anyone want to share what like your what's your experience or what do you think of this video clip that we just saw of Kimberly Crenshaw? Okay. see the chat. Okay. Okay, well, <laughs> we can move on to the next piece on defining liberation. 
So when I was looking up like a de definition, like a working definition of liberation, I kind of uh, came across some like roadblocks. I feel like there's, you know, there's definitely limitations to, to language. Um, and these definitions, these things are like growing and evolving and like shifting and changing. Um, so I just put a, a, a several quotes that had me contemplating and like thinking about what exactly is liberation. So here I wanted to ask if I could get some volunteers to read a couple of quotes uh, from some of the feminist scholars, activists, advocates that I follow and inform, you know, my social justice practice. Could I get one person? Uh, you can go ahead and unmute yourself to read this this definition of freedom by Mia Birdsong. I'll read it. Okay. The American dream tells us that freedom is the state of being unburdened and unconstrained by others or systems. It's about having choices and being able to fully express ourselves. It's having the power to be who we want, go where we want and do what we want. But we tend to understand it as actually an individualistic concept. This is where we have to expand our understanding to fold in what is actually an older understanding of freedom. A free person was someone who was joined to a tribe of free people by ties of kinship and rights of belonging. Freedom was the idea that together we can ensure that we have the things we need. We all have the things we need. That's a very important word. We all have the things we need, love, food, shelter, safety. The way I've come to understand it, freedom is both an individual and collective endeavor, a multi-layered process, not a static state of being. Being free is in part, in part achieved through being connected. Um, this brings my own awareness to like who is not free in many ways like to participate in this conversation today, such as people who are, mm -hmm. thank you. Thank you for reading that. So the next up, can I get someone else to read? Uh, this quote by Dara Cooper. I'm happy to read. Okay, thank you. As part of our liberation, the earth teaches us that everything, everything is connected. The soil needs rain, organic matter, air, warms, and life in order to do what it needs to do to give and receive life. The element is an essential component. Organizing takes humility, selflessness, and patience and rhythm, while our ultimate goal of liberation will take many expert components. Some of us build and fight for land, healthy bodies, healthy relationships, clean air, water, homes, safety, dignity, and humanizing education. Others of us fight for food and political prisoners and abolition and environmental justice. Our work is intersectional and multifaceted. Nature teaches us that our work has to be nuanced and steadfast, and more than anything, that we need each other at our highest natural glory in order to get free. In, in the chat, if you notice some themes arising just from these two quotes, feel free to share it in the chat. Thank you for reading that. Uh, so next up, I could get three people. We got Bell Hook, Ruth Wilson, Gilmore, quote me, quote by, and Nora Samarin. Or Samarin. Um, can I get three more folks? I'm Debbie. Um, it is necessary to remember as we think critically about domination that we all have the capacity to act in ways that oppress, dominate, wound, whether or not that power is institutionalized. It is necessary to remember that it is, the, it is first the potential oppressor within that we must resist, the potential victim we, within that we must rescue. Otherwise, we cannot hope for an end to domination for liberation. To me, it's sounding like Bill Hooks one. is talking about, oh, I'm sorry. I just want to say like for sorry. me, it sounds like Bill Hooks is saying like liberation is an end of domination. I meant to bold that out for it. Okay, go ahead. I'm sorry. I'm cutting you off. 
Um, abolition is about presence, not about absence, not absence. It's about building life affirming institutions. Ruth Wilson Gilmore. You wanna read the next one since that was short. <laughs> sure. When communities identify and interrupt systemic violence, prioritize the needs of those harmed and hold a circle of belonging that humanizes everyone, they create, create a foundation that can begin to resist and repair the harms inflicted by patriarchy, white supremacy and capitalism. Nora Samaran. I don't know if I pronounced that right. So I'm looking at the chat. <clears throat> I'm seeing like this, the theme that is emerging, and that's what I was seeing when I came up with these quotes, is that liberation is a, a collective, it's a collective effort, and we are connected. It's, inter, it's about interconnectedness. Interconnectedness. Um, let's see. So, and it's, Kirsten says that liberation is both deeply personal and a collective effort that we cannot achieve alone. We are interdependent. So if we're gonna get free, we need each other. Okay, so the last one, I'm, I'll read this. Um, this. This quote is by Sonia Renee Taylor. And this was in one of her IGTV, What's Up Y'all videos. And the, the video was about why anti-racism is not enough or is not the answer to transformation and liberation. Uh, so, you know, early I included that, that quote about abolition not being like, let me go back, oh, can I go back to it? Yeah, abolition is about presence, not absence. Um, so this, like what Sonia Renee Taylor is talking about is like what we want to have in place of these systems of oppression. So liberation is not a deficit-based model. Liberation is not about what we are against. Liberation is an abundance based energy. It is the unobstructed access to each person's ability to manifest the highest version of themselves. Nothing is in the way. And if we're not cultivating that, then what are we cultivating? So any thoughts about that, like liberation being an abundance based energy, unobstructed access to people manifesting their high, the highest version of themselves. Feel free to share. And what, what Sonia Renee Taylor talks about in that video is that let's say you uproot a system of repression like racism, like white supremacy, or like anti-fatness, that hatred that will be a, uh, if you uproot it, but if you don't plant something else in its place, something that you do want, like it might, another weed might come in and fill its place, like a void, you know, a vacuum must be filled. Uh, and so if we don't uproot these and then plant something new, like we'll just be doing an oppression whack-a-ball um, so this is why, like the internet, well, we'll talk more about that. Let me just leave that. Okay. And so the next up is health at every size. So I just wanted to name that, like, I, you know, I'm a dietitian, so I often am in online dietitian spaces. And recently, uh, I was privy to, like, there was this argument in the online dietitian space about what exactly is health at every size. And it was very clear um, that Folks didn't read the syllabus. No, they didn't read the most recent principles of, of health at every size. There's still like so much confusion, even though there are a lot of folks who claim to be health at every size aligned. Um, and so I just wanted to, you know, I just wanted to put these out here, the most recent version. And although these, these principles, I think, I believe they're updated in 2013 or 2016. I can't remember the exact date, but there's still like, there's still room for growth and transformation. But this is what we're working with now. How like health at every size is about weight inclusivity, health, health enhancement, and not just like personal health advancement, enhancement, but supporting health policy. Um, so like a systemic level, uh, respectful care. Oops, sorry. Let me go back. Ah, I can't go back. There, there is oh, no there high. We go. Uh, respectful care. Okay, I'm not going to get into all of this. I'm sure everyone who's here <laughs> uh, has this understanding of what these were, what these principles are. So next, I want to make a case for why intersectional liberation and health at every size is important, uh, and like why intersectionality is so important for our Hayes movement. Uh, and so I'm not going to use my own words, but I'm going to, uh, I have a video of uh, Audre Lorde, 
uh, Queen Mother Audre Lorde talking about um, intersectionality. There is no hierarchy of oppressions by Audre Lorde. I was born black and a woman. I am trying to become the strongest person I can become, to live the life I have been given, and to help affect change toward a livable future for this earth and for my children. As a black, lesbian, feminist, socialist, poet, mother of two, including one boy and member of an interracial couple, I usually find myself part of some group in which the majority defines me as deviant, difficult, inferior, or just plain wrong. From my membership in all of these groups, I have learned that oppression and the intolerance of difference come in all shapes and sizes and colors and sexualities, and that among those of us who share the goals of liberation and a workable future for our children, there can be no hierarchies of oppression. I have learned that sexism, a belief in the inherent superiority of one sex over all others and thereby its right to dominance, and heterosexism, a belief in the inherent superiority of one pattern of loving over all others and thereby its right to dominance, both arise from the same source as racism, a belief in the inherent superiority of one race over all others and thereby its right to dominance. Oh, says a voice from the black community, but being black is normal. Well, I and many black people of my age can remember grimly the days when it didn't used to be. I simply do not believe that one aspect of myself can possibly profit from the oppression of another part of my identity. I know that my people cannot possibly profit from the oppression of any other group which seeks the right to peaceful existence. Rather, we diminish ourselves by denying to others what we have shed blood to obtain for our children. And those children need to learn that they do not have to become like each other in order to work together for a future they will all share. The increasing attacks upon lesbians and gay men are only an introduction to the increasing attacks upon all black people. For wherever oppression manifests itself in this country, black people are potential victims. And it is a standard of right-wing cynicism to encourage members of oppressed groups to act against each other. And so long as we are divided because of our particular identities, we cannot join together in effective political action. Within the lesbian community, I am black, and within the black community, I am a lesbian. Any attack against black people is a lesbian and gay issue because I and thousands of other black women are part of the lesbian community. Any attack against lesbians and gays is a black issue because thousands of lesbians and gay men are black. There is no hierarchy of oppression. It is not accidental that the Family Protection Act which is virulently anti-woman and anti-black, is also anti-gay. As a black person, I know who my enemies are. And when the Ku Klux Klan goes to court in Detroit to try and force the Board of Education to remove books the Klan believes hint at homosexuality, then I know I cannot afford the luxury of fighting one form of oppression only. I cannot afford to believe that freedom from intolerance is the right of only one particular group, and I cannot afford to choose between the fronts upon which I must battle these forces of discrimination wherever they appear to destroy me. And when they appear to destroy me, it will not be long before they appear to destroy you. So in, in the chat, feel free to, if you have any takeaways from this. I know for me, like when I'm thinking about health at every size, like looking, thinking, of this, thinking about this Hayes movement, is like health at every size is a black issue. Health at every size is a queer issue, it is a trans issue, it is a disability issue, and we can't, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And like we can't separate those because going back to like liberation, like we are all connected, um, and these movements are all connected, it's like everything is everything. There is, there is no hierarchy of oppressions. Right. Okay. So next up, I'm going to get into how, <clears throat> how you can develop a social justice practice. Uh, and I believe that if you are here, that you probably have already started doing these things. You probably already have a social justice practice. So we're just going to talk about it a little bit more in depth. Uh, and so I want to, I want to, these are, this is just my conceptualization of it. Um, this is not like the way, uh, the standard way to develop a social justice practice. 
or practice. Um, this is also not linear, um, but this is just how it shows up on the screen, like these bullet points. But I didn't have, I, I had, at one point I had numbers and I wanted to make sure that this is not like a step-by-step -step way to do things. But in developing, at least my conceptual eviction, in developing social justice practice, I think it's important that we all increase awareness of systemic oppression, uh, increase our aware, not just our awareness, but our understanding of systemic oppression. Then we have to become aware of who we are, our blind spots, and like how we show up in the world. And I, I just want to say it's like that we are all, like we all have blind spots. Like we're all growing and evolving. I mean, they're blind spots for a reason. We don't know they're there, but like hopefully we're all committed uh, to like when those blind spots are unveiled to us, to addressing them and growing and evolving. Um, but it's important to figure out what those, you know, figure out what those are and then how we show up in the world. And when I say how we show up in the world, it's like, what is our position, positionality like in these systems of oppression? Um, and then another, the next, or yeah, find your people. Like since we, we already talked about how this liberation movement, Health at Every Size, is, it's, it's about community and connectedness. So we have to find our people. Uh, and the next, we wanna change the collective imagination. This goes back to like what Sonia Renee Taylor was saying, how like, it's not just about, you know, going after like what we're against, but planting something new. So for me, I think it's important to be in that dream space and that imagination space uh, and that visioning space. Like, what do we really want? What is the world that we want to create? And then the last thing, at least on this, this slide, is we have to engage in political action. So I'm gonna talk about more of these, uh, all of these in depth. So first we're gonna talk about increasing awareness of systemic oppression. I wanted to make sure this is a, it's a cycle, it's an ongoing thing. It's never, there's never a point when we all have arrived. Um, this is something that we're, we're all always gonna be growing and learning and evolving. Um, and so just like what I was saying, how like health at every size, health at every size has a white supremacy issue. It has a racism, anti-blackness issue. Um, it has an ableism issues. Like all of these different systems of oppression, like in our movement, why it's important to focus on all these things is because they are so, you know, interconnected. Um, and some of the like white supremacy, racism, anti-blackness, colonialism, imperialism, capitalism, and patriarchy, these are some of like the foundations upon which like anti-fatness and fat hatred or fat phobia, weight stigma, diet culture, the things that we often hear about, like when we talk about health at every size, you know, diet, we focus on diet culture, um, but we don't talk about enough, at least, I think we don't talk enough about the foundations upon which you know that system of oppression or those systems of oppression stand and like we have to address all of them if we want to like topple these systems of oppression we have to get at you know these roots so neely fuller is a sociologist uh he said if he quoted he said if you don't understand racism and white supremacy what it is and how it works everything else you think you understand will only confuse you. So I wanted to get into, like maybe in the chat, if folks like, what is your understanding or your definition of white supremacy? I'll say, I, like I can read, I'll read right now, uh, the Merriam-Webster version. And the Merriam-Webster version, I think is, is, you know, it's limited. Like there, there are limited limitations to language, but it says that, White supremacy is the belief that the white race is inherently superior to other races and that white people should have control over people of, a, uh, of over people of other races. It is also white supremacy is also the social, economic, and political systems that collectively enable white people to maintain power over people of other races. And so this visual, um, I'm not gonna get into it too much, but I just wanted to like point out like a lot of folks think that white supremacy. Uh, white supremacy and racism is just like the top, the top, the apex of this triangle. Um, and like it's the most like egregious, the most harmful and deadly um, aspects of white supremacy. But this is, if this is like an iceberg, there's all of these smaller, not smaller, like these things that probably had like black folks, other people of color experience on a cumulative and ongoing basis. Um, like, the, yeah, these things end up being, you know, harmful. They cause weathering and, um, the, you know, they increase our allostatic load. But like these things are also white supremacy. 
things like denying uh, white privilege, denying racism, white saviorism, white savior complex, tokenism, paternalism. Um, this is also a part of white supremacy. So, okay. Next up to our next experiential activity uh, is what is white supremacy culture and how does it show up in Hayes spaces? So I'm gonna, there's another visual. So in the chat, I'm gonna go over each of these I wanna look at the time, okay. So I'm gonna go over each of these. Um, and then in the chat, like I would love to hear about your experiences with you know, these different components, these characteristics of white supremacy culture and how they've showed, shown up uh, in Hayes spaces or in your Hayes work or like just what you have experienced. Please feel free, feel free to share. So let me pull up my notes. Um, I have a link for this, but don't worry, you know, I will share the, the resources for this. But so perfectionism, perfectionism, and this is particularly looking at organizations. Um, the perfectionism, there's literal appreciation expressed for people in the work that they do. Uh, there, in perfectionism, there is, it's more common to point out how the person or the work that they do is inadequate. Um, it's, it's mis mistakes are seen as personal, uh, a personal reflection of folks and not, you know, for just like what they are, they are just mistakes. Uh, and making mistakes is confused with being a mistake. Like I made a mistake, no, I am a mistake. That often happens, of doing wrong with being wrong. Uh, there's little time and energy or money put into reflection of identifying lessons learned that can improve practice. Um, so in other words, there's no learning from mistakes and there's a, t a tendency to identify what is wrong and little ability to identify name and appreciate what is right. So perfectionism, I can even talk about how this has showed up. I may or may not have a little meltdown before this presentation because I wanted it to be perfect. And I was like, ah, that's white supremacy culture showing up in me. But I should also mention that white supremacy culture, like you don't have to be white to uphold white supremacy culture. Uh, you don't have to be white to be a white supremacist. Like this impacts people of color, white people, and it impacts us all. Okay, so then sense of urgency, a sense of urgency, this continued sense of urgency, it makes it difficult to take time to be inclusive, encouraging democratic and thoughtful decision making, or to think long term, or to consider consequences. This frequently results in sacrificing potential allies. For example, my sacrifice the interests of communities of color in order uh, to win victories for white people. So like, and white people are seen as the default. I know I've definitely seen this in Hayes, like when, when folks say like, oh, well, we can't talk about racism when we talk about Hayes, that also like that implies that the default person is white or like that's what happens. Um, also the sense of urgency that shows up in like funding uh, where like in organizations where people promise too much work for too little money and funders who, who expect too much for too little. The, okay, so defensiveness. So in an organizational structure, or let's talk about in this movement, there's more energy spent on trying to prevent harm in a, or for a, prevent abuse and protect power as it exists, rather than facilitating the best out of each person. This, this defense of this, um, it inspires either or thinking, criticism of those with power is viewed as threatening and inappropriate or rude. Uh, people respond to new and challenging ideas with defensiveness, making it very difficult to raise ideas. And the defenses of people in power creates an oppressive culture. Then there's also so quantity over quality. I thought I, when I was looking at this, I thought about like in academia or in research, like in, in dietetics, in medicine, like what that which is quantifiable is like held up as the gold standard. So like quantitative research is more important than qualitative. Quantitative, like numbers, is more important than um, life, like lived experience. So with quantity over quality, it's all resources of the organization are directed towards producing measurable goals. If it can't be measured, it's not valuable, it doesn't exist. And little or no value attached, is attached to it. Yes, show me the data. So the next up is worship of the written word. Um, so if it's not in a memo, if it's not an email, it doesn't exist. The, the organization or movement 
don't value other ways in which information gets shared. I know uh, like black folks, or a lot of BIPOC folks in our communities, like there's an oral tradition, like where history and knowledge and stories are passed on like orally, verbally, but that's in white supremacy culture, like that is not um, respected or valued as much as a written word. Uh, this is okay. So the only being, I see this a lot. There's only one right way. I see this a lot in haze. Like there's only one right way to do haze. Um, so there's the belief that there's one right way, right way to do things. And once people are introduced to the right way, they will see the light and adopt it. When they do not adapt or change, that something is wrong with them, the others, those not changing, not with us. Uh, and similar to the missionary who does not see the value in the culture of other communities sees only value in their beliefs about what is good. Okay, so paternalism, this is where decision-making is, is clear to those with power and unclear to those without. Those with power think that they are capable of making decisions for and in the interest of those without power. Instead of it, like, you know, we've been talking about collaboration and collectivism, this, uh, this paternalism leaves all of the power and the decision-making to those like in power instead of like, all of us. Um, yeah, I'm gonna skip so, so the either or thinking, I see this a lot in Hades too. Either or thinking, right or wrong, yes or no, black and white, binary thinking. Okay, power, uh, power hoarding. I'm just gonna keep going. I'm looking at time, so I'm gonna keep going. So power hoarding. So there's little, if any, value around sharing power. Power is seen as limited, only so much to go around. Those with power feel threatened when anyone suggests changes and how things should be done in the organization or in the movement. Feel suggestions for change are a reflection of their leadership. Those with power don't see themselves as hoarding power or as feeling threatened. And those with the power assume they have the best interest of the organization at heart and assume those wanting changes are ill-informed, emotional, or inexperienced. So fear of open conflict, People in power are scared of conflict and try to ignore it or run from it. When someone raises an issue that causes discomfort, the response is to blame the person for raising the issue rather than to look at the issue which is actually causing the problem. There's an emphasis on being polite and equating the raising of difficult issues with impolite, rude, or out of line. So individualism. So I think like, should I, I think I'm gonna skip over this one. The individualism versus collectivism. Okay, uh, I'm the only one. If I'm the only one, it's like, if I, if I don't do it, if anything is gonna get done, then I have to do it. It's like, it's connected to that individualism. There's little or no ability to delegate work to others. So progress is bigger or more. So observed, in, this is often observed in systems of accountability and the ways we determine success. Progress in an organization which expands or develops the ability to serve more people, but this gives no value, uh, not even negative value to its cost. For example, increased accountability, blah, blah, blah. I'm not gonna go get, get all into that. Objective, object, objectivity, there's the belief that, that objectivity uh, exists. Uh, the belief that emotions are inherently destructive, irrational, and should not play a role in decision-making or group process invalidating people who show emotion and requiring people to think in a linear fashion and ignoring or invalidating those who think in other ways. And the last one is right to comfort. The belief that those with power have a right to emotional and psychological comfort, um, scapegoating those who cause discomfort and equating individual acts of unfairness against white people with systemic racism which daily targets people of color. I know that was a whole lot, <laughs> a whole lot. So I'm going to go to the next slide. And I'm going to skip over this just for the sake of time. I want to get into like ways like how we can um, become aware of who we are, how we show up in the world. And this, I can share this in the email, um, the compassion and self-assessment. And so we're gonna get into this like together. We're gonna to spend some time like reflecting, but before then I wanna take a little music break. Um, and I'm gonna play this song. And then I want folks to think about like in what ways 
um, does white supremacy culture like show up in you uh, and show up in Hayes spaces and in your Hayes related work? So before we get into that, I want to play this song and then we're going to spend, let's say like 10 minutes reflecting on um, all that stuff that we just went over. If you ever hear me talk, like you know, if you came to the annual meeting, annual meeting, you know I like a good song, a good playlist. So, um, yeah. So I want us to take a little bit of time, just for the sake of time, maybe five minutes, um, to reflect on this. Like, who are you? In what ways are you? Let me move this. I can't read my own slide. There we go. In what ways are you privileged, and in what ways are you oppressed? In what ways does white supremacy culture show up in you? And in what ways have you per perpetuated white supremacy culture in your Hayes-related work or spaces? So this is a lot, this is a big question. Uh, and we are, lim we are limited on time, so you don't have to think about all of it. <laughs> um, this is something that, you know, this is an ongoing conversation. Uh, this presentation is just scratching the surface. Um, we will be talking about this in ASDA like in our upcoming events, we'll be talking about this theme for the rest of our board year. Um, so yeah, don't worry about the timing, but let's take about five minutes. If it'll be helpful, I could pull up the the characteristics of white supremacy culture or the compassionate spectrum. Maybe I'll do that. I'll go ahead and just do that. Back up. Don't play the song again. Okay. Sorry. So maybe in the chat, if there's like one thing from this big question, this multi, this multi question, um, yeah, in the chat, if you can share like one thing that came up for you when exploring. Thank you, thank you.
Okay, so just I'm looking at time. <clears throat> so I'm going to kind of speed through the rest of the slides. Um, so find your people. I'm just going to share this quote by Audre Lorde that without community, there is no liberation. So, but community, but community must not mean a shedding of our differences, nor the pathetic pretense that these differences do not exist. So, it's so important, like this social justice work, this liberation work, this help at every size movement work is not an individualistic, uh, an individual endeavor. It is a community endeavor. Um, so, so important to find your people. Uh, I'm sure if you all are here, uh, you you have some of your people, uh, but there are other communities and spaces like that you could join and be a part of. Uh, and I'll I have a slide about that later. Okay. So the next up is changing the collective uh, Hayes imagination. Uh, and so <clears throat> I remember when I was first introduced to Hayes uh, about uh, about a decade ago. Um, I, the the way that I the way that I learned about it was a very individualistic um, endeavor. It's like if you know you know fat people can be healthy if you just eat well and if you just move right like you could be okay. Um, very just so much on the individual. And so there's this, there's this um, awesome series of slides that I found on Instagram from account from a sexuality like health STI mulate stimulate. Let me just go ahead and read it because I'm like getting tongue tied. Okay, so none of us can take sole credit for our health. We owe our health to countless other humans, non human animals, plants, fungi, bacteria, and natural systems. Health is a collaborative effort. Everyone is intrinsically deserving of life sustenance, water, food, medicine, and everything else the earth provides by virtue of being alive. Yet we live with human made systems that threaten or support people's health in disparate ways. If health access is shaped by social, economic, and political forces, then health outcomes are often extensions of the privileges and oppressions we experience. At the same time that our society restricts or promotes health according to social location, it also rewards people for their, in parentheses, actual or perceived health while punishing others for their actual or perceived lack of it. So health is a combination of systemic, environmental, and individual factors. Treating freedom and autonomy as rewards earned through one's health falsely reduces the complex systemic, environmental, individual reality of health into a purely individual one. Freedom and autonomy are our birthrights, and also we undeniably impact each other's health through personal and collective choices. So what if we navigated freedom collaboratively rather than individually? What if we navigated health collaboratively rather than individually? So they have to stimulate or STI emulate on health and freedom during the COVID-19 pandemic. <clears throat> this also goes back to what Sonia was saying about planting like what we wanna see. Um, so yeah, what, what does that look like? I mean, no, you don't have to answer that now, but like, yeah, what if we did this as a collaborative collective effort? What would Hayes, what our movement look like? Okay. Can I put that quote the, on health in the chat? So, uh, Annie, could you help me out with that? I don't know if you can. Okay. And so the last part, the last part of my conceptualization, the conceptualization of developing a social justice taxes is to engage in political action. Um, so we have the individual, we have the collective, and then there's the systemic, and like we have the power to make changes. So this is also like in you know Hayes principle number two, in its current iteration, it, it is health enhancement, it's supporting health policies that improve and equalize access to information and services. And so the way I see it is not that we it's not that we just support these health policies, but we get to create them, we get to advocate for them, we get to push for them, like we are you know active participants in the creation of these health policies. Uh, and so one way that you can engage in political action is one to give a shout out to um, Art Dayton, our um, advocacy and development director. This year is putting together an abolishing the BMI coalition. And that's one way um, for you to be involved with ASDA and like our advocacy work um, on a, you know, political systemic uh, 
policy you know, access level. Um, so stay tuned for that. Uh, so yeah, so how can we join that coalition? So I will just say stay tuned. Uh, we are in the beginning stages of thinking about it and like making it come to come to fruition. So if you like, as long as you stay tuned, you'll see uh, announcements via email or um, via our social media channels, like you will be informed um, when the opportunity arises. Okay, so there's one activity, I know that we are short on time, but I wanna, I really wanna, Makiba, formerly known as Imani, is someone who is close to my heart. And I want us to think about, uh, think about her and like how the Hayes movement can address her needs. So I'm going to explain who Makiba is. This is our last experiential activity. So I'm just gonna read. Uh, so Makiba is a 47 year old in Trinidad, trans and queer black woman who immigrated from Jamaica when she was a teenager. She's a naturalized U.S. citizen, but when she speaks, people know that she's not originally from here. Phenotypically, she's unmistakably African, sub-Saharan, dark skin, full lips, broad nose, and 4C texture hair. Imani lives with chronic illnesses and invisible disabilities. So HIV, diabetes, major depressive disorder. She was raised Catholic, but gave up on religion years ago and now identifies as agnostic. She lives in poverty and relies on public safety nets including social security, disability insurance, Medicaid, food stamps, et cetera. She has experienced a great deal of discrimination and stigma because of her multiple marginalized identities. So Makiba is not real, but people like her exist in the world. And it's my belief that, you know, rising, what's the quote, the quote goes, a rising tide raises all ships. Um, that when we take care of the Makibas of the world, the most marginalized, like we are all, um, we, we all benefit um, or we are all taken care of if the most marginalized are. Uh, and so Makiba is just <clears throat> like a, a client that I came up with, but yeah, it's not real. So my question to you all, a discussion for the chat, is to think about what systems of oppression are Makiba dealing with? What are the environmental and societal factors that might negatively impact her ability to access health and healthcare? And how could ASDA and the Greater Hayes Movement support Makiba and those like her? So this, you know, the Health at Every Size Movement, it's centered relatively affluent, um, you know, fat white women uh, or thin white people. Um, and the Makibas of the world are often left out. And so I want us to think about like how how can we center Makiba? Um, how can we better serve her? So, okay, so I know that we're out of time, um, but I am willing to hang around for another 10, 15 minutes um, so I can keep going. If you all would like, there's only a couple of more slides. I just want to do like a wrap up and closing. Um, but we can take, let's take maybe five minutes for this to think about it. Um, and then we'll wrap up. Okay, yes, I'll go back to Makiba. Um, and Katie, yes, we, we can, for those who are, who register, those who are in attendance, um, anyone who registered for the event, uh, will get the recording and we can also, uh, you know, provide like a bulleted list of, of the, what happened in the, happened in the chat. And let me go back, sorry. These are good questions to ask me. 
I'm seeking to always ask myself, what am I missing because of my privileges? What do I not see here, experience because of my privileges? Yeah. Yeah. For those of you all who are leaving, thank you all so much for coming, for participating, for being so engaged. Uh, I am feeling grateful to be in community with you all, and I look forward to seeing you at the next as the event. Thank you, Bill, and thank you, Sumner. So, uh, Beth, so Infinifat, <clears throat> um, Infinifat folks are the largest of fat folks um, in the health at every size space, and a lot of like pl in plus size, you know, fat spaces like small fats like me um, often uh, take up a lot of space, um, and the largest of fat folks are left out. Um, yeah, they're left out. So I hope I kind of was okay describing that. Infinite fat folks are the largest of fat folks. Thank you, Tigress, for your, for the link. <clears throat> so once again, this is, these are ongoing questions to ask ourselves and to like always think about. Like I always like to have Makiba in mind when I'm doing the work that I do. Um, so I hope that you all also think about her in your work. Thank you, Patrilli. So, um, so now we're just gonna do a deep brief wrap up and a call to action. Uh, so let's see. Uh oh, I think we did, okay. Okay, well, I'm just gonna go ahead to the, I'm gonna skip ahead. <laughs> to the call to action. So um, so this year, ASDA, we are pushing, so we are, ASDA is mostly a volunteer uh, run organization. Uh, we are also predominantly white, uh, white membership based <laughs> organization. Uh, and our, but our leadership team is uh, majority BIPOC. Uh, and we have been we've been having ongoing conversations about being in right relationships, uh, being in abundance, and like how can we make it so that the folks that are doing the labor of this organization can be paid by POC folks with multiple marginalized identities. Um, so I want to thank everyone who paid at an accomplice level for this event. Um, but there are also opportunities, different ways that you can financially contribute to as this work. Um, so you can go to our website at asda.org and you can click donate. And this is just a breakdown of what donations can do. Um, you can pay, you know, we can pay presenters. Like we have, I have a whole list of like people I would love, love to hear speak about health at every size and intersectionality. Um, and we want to be able, and like a lot of these folks are, you know, BIPOC folks, and we want to be able to pay them what they are worth. Um, so your donations would help pay um, presenters. Uh, we'll be able to uh, offer one free member or membership or community event. Uh, we're also working on providing a new a new Hayes listing. So if you're a provider, 
Um, so your donations, um, our organization grows and thrives uh, because of generous generosity, abundant, uh, abundance-based uh, thinkers like you. So I just want to encourage that. Also, I want to encourage folks, like there are some people here who, um, who are not members of ASDA, uh, and I want to, like, I want to encourage you to join, to actually become a member of ASDA. Um, yeah, we want ASDA, we want ASDA to look like the world that we live in, um, and, you know, the vast majority of our membership is white, and we want to change that, um, and I'm working, you know, like, uh, I mean, the team, all of us, not just me, but we're working on shifting and changing things so that the space is safe for BIPOC folks. Um, so we do offer for BIPOC folks, so it's Black and Indigenous and other people of color, there's a full scholarship, no, no questions asked, and you get a zero, zero dollar membership for, you know, uh, our, our membership is on an annual basis. Then we also have income-based reduced rates that depending on your income are zero to seventy-five dollars for annual membership, and then the full rate membership is one hundred dollars. And so you get access to member benefits, you get discounts to our educational events like this. Um, so definitely want to encourage folks. If your membership has lapsed, uh, if you were once a member of ASLA, we want you to come on back. Um, and so next up, so our next event, I just want to. Uh, give a little shout out to her little promo for our next event. We have a membership, a member event that will be happening November 15th at 12 p.m. Pacific time, 3 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, and so we'll be having, uh, join us in community for networking, socializing and learning together. Uh, we, have some, we have some great things lined up for that event. So we hope that you all can come. Members, it's free for members to join. Uh, and then I know we're already at time, a lot of folks are leaving, but there is a little room for Q&A. Um, let's see. So I'm going to stop my share. Okay. But if there are any questions, I may not have all the answers, but some of us are on the team are here, it would also help. Thank you, Maria. Thank you all for attending. Um, whew, I was so nervous. <laughs> so thank you all for making this it's just a great experience for me <laughs> as the facilitator presenter. Um, yeah. But are there any any questions? Any questions? Okay. Hi, oh, I have. Hand. I have a question. First of all, this was wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, it's extremely exciting. Um, I was taking notes like a maniac, although, um, uh, you know, I know it's going to be recorded. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm psyched that I can donate monthly. That's been a big thing for me um, to want to do that. Putting that aside, I'm just, you know, as someone, as one of the um, as one of the white ladies who's been in here a long time and want really wanting to um, support and be helpful to the new leadership, um, the newer folks. I'm just wondering if there are other specific asks to support you and the organization. Um, I know it's run on a shoestring and a thin shoestring at that. So just any other thoughts about ways we can be supportive and helpful to you? Is there anyone else on the, on the leadership team who can chime in on can answer that question. I can, I can share a few thoughts <laughs> um, without getting into too too deep of specifics. I I would say like financial support is just like by far and away the biggest need for ASDA right now. We have a small, passionate, very hardworking team. And we, we very firmly believe that every single one of them needs to get paid a, a living wage rate for the work that they do. And that's our primary goal as we move into this year and the next year. Um, 
And that said, um, you might have noticed that we have not been focusing on committee work or volunteer work very much. And the primary reasons for that is that we do not get in the people that reflect our values when we have those like volunteer um, opportunities. And we end up spending a lot of time educating, trying to get people on the same page as our vision. Um, and we end up actually just putting in a lot of labor, which is mostly BIPOC folks doing the labor to educate what ends up being mostly white people about these issues and how we want to communicate this. So um, we are planning on figuring out how to harness volunteer power moving forward. Um, but in this moment, the biggest thing we need is to support the nine very dedicated folks that we have in doing the work that they're doing right now. Hi, um, you. so this is this is Petrilli, and I said I would leave like 10 minutes ago, but I was so energized by this discussion. Um, so I serve as um, the treasurer for this upcoming board term, and I support Annie and Veronica and their amazing work, and I am uh, work with them around fundraising. And just looking at the numbers, yeah, reaching financial stability um, will increase the capacity of what we're able to do in our advocacy efforts and our membership and our programming like so, so much. So whether that is, right, I shared some information on monthly donorship, um, there's one-time donations, any of our giving campaigns or, um, or um, asks uh, in the upcoming year, um, increasing our membership, right, is also a huge priority of ours. So if you um, come across folks that um, are Hazel Line providers or, you know, are engaged in Hazel work in every way, um, uh, encourage them to become a member, right? And um, so these are all ways that we can increase our visibility um, and that increases our financial assets to be able to have paid staff um, because that's gonna be really critical to moving this work forward um, at, a, at, a, at a more speedy pace, so. Thank you, Annie and Patrilli, for when I don't have the words. Thank you all for <laughs> explaining things so eloquently. Um, so yeah, on that note, any other any other questions, thoughts, comments? Anything? Okay. Thank you, Patrilli. Well, on that note, I guess we can wrap up. Thank you all so much for coming. Thank you for being in community and collaboration, <laughs> co-creating this moment, this experience uh, together. And I look forward to seeing you in November at our membership event. And then stay tuned for December. We'll have another educational event. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everyone.